Welcome to Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Planting the seed of truth and growing families in the Word of God. We're going to finish up tonight. In fact, I didn't even title it Heaven uh, because we are going to talk about being eternity-minded. All of this that we've been studying the last three weeks about heaven, the new heaven, the new earth, it should change more than just how we look at the future. It should change how we're living now. It should really make us very aware of the spiritual realm. It should make us very aware that this is a drop in the bucket. Uh, we put so much emphasis. I was thinking about bucket lists. Uh, people, you know, have bucket list, things they want to get done before they die. And I thought, you know, this teaching just really does away with that because we are eternal beings. We're going to spend eternity somewhere, and we don't have to have bucket lists. Uh, we, we can finish up anything, I'm sure, on the, the new earth that we didn't get done that we wanted to do here. And so it just really changes our perspective, and it makes it so important that we do what's necessary here on this earth, in this age, to get everybody we can in on our eternity. And so, to me, it's just really made me aware of a lot of different things because I've been so concentrated on the subject. Go with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. I believe we read this in one of the sessions, and part of it really caught my attention. 2 Peter chapter 3. I did do notes for you tonight because, as you can see, we're going to cover a lot of ground. So if you'll kind of stay ahead of me and get turned to the next scripture while I'm talking, if you can do that and listen at the same time. 2 Peter 3, I'm reading out of the NIV starting in verse 10. It says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. We did. We covered that last week, didn't we? It says, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Man, when we read that, I was like, man, if we're really aware that this earth and everything in it is going to be burnt, burnt up by fire and the new heaven and new earth are going to come into play, how should we be living? What really is important? What Doesn't that just prioritize your life? Because we spend so much time on things that are going to disappear, on things that are going to just be literally melted away. And, and this really brought attention to that to me. What kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. And I love this part, as you look forward, as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. We are looking forward. I almost titled it that tonight. We are looking forward. We're spending way too much time uh, on things that don't matter. There are more important things. And look, God wants us to have fun. He wants us to enjoy life. I'm, I am a full believer that he's a good dad. And he looks down here and he gets a kick out of it when you're having a good time. But this will help you prioritize that and keep it in the right order. And to me, the, the knowledge that we've gained in the last three weeks... It, sh it should and it will change how I live now. And how I live now, what we're going to find out tonight, how I live now will affect how I live then. And most people never think about it, but there's some pretty interesting scriptures. So shouldn't we live now with eternity in mind? If, if we know that how we live now is going to affect how we live then, then perhaps we should keep eternity in mind uh, while we're while we're living. And I believe our relationship with him, Brett, what we want to get to is that we so desire, if we can picture this, standing before the throne of God with our Savior, our Lord, and Jesus Christ sitting at the right hand. 
and to stand before him and him go, well done. That's everything. Well done, good and faithful servant. So turn, turn to Matt, 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 that's the way I have it in my notes, Matthew 25. And let's look at that story that Jesus is telling. I'm going to read it to you out of the NIV. Matthew 25, verse 14. He's just given another example. He's really, man, the Gospels are so powerful. We need to at some point go through and just read the Gospels. Verse 14 says, Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. This is likening this to Jesus. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more, and also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. And after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. And his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. That's a very interesting statement right there. We'll look at it again here in Luke 19 in just a moment. Come and share in your master's happiness. Verse 22. The man with two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. And his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. As you know, the one with men, one talent went and hid it in the earth. He didn't do anything with it. And when you think about this, these guys were given according to their ability. The amount they were given didn't matter when the master returned. It's what they did with what they had been given. Both of them, he said, well done. Because I think sometimes we look at ministries or we look at people who can do more, it seems like, than what we can do or accomplishing more than we can accomplish. It's about what God's given you to do. And both of these guys kept in mind the master's return. That's where their focus was. They wanted to accomplish something with what he had given them before his return. The one talent guy, not so much. And if you go and you read this, which we're not going to do tonight, if you go and read Luke 19, the master tells them to occupy until he returns, to occupy until he comes. And when you look that word occupy up, it means busy themselves. They have things to do. We're not just supposed to look forward to heaven and sit here and do nothing. We're supposed to busy ourselves, occupy until he comes, and occupy ourselves doing what he will like when he returns. I think it's key. Also in Luke 19, it's very fascinating. We're here at Use the Talents. In Luke 19, his, his return to them, what he says when he returns to them, he gives them authority over cities. Now, it's very interesting after studying the new Jerusalem and the new heavens and the new earth. He said, look, you've been faithful over what I've given you. I'm going to give you authority over cities. So you might want to go back and study that because he does that as a reward for their stewardship, which tells me the way we live now matters then. It matters. It all matters. Now and eternity are not two separate things. They are connected. As we saw on that video the first night, they overlap. And we tend to separate them in head like, now, this is the way I'm living now, this is the way I'll live then. They're not separated. They are connected, and what we do here matters. And as much as I enjoyed teaching the, the new heaven and the new earth, here matters. <laughs> and it matters now, and it will matter then. 
and that should cause a mind shift in me. That should change how I am living, not out of fear. But the master is coming. The master is coming. This is what he gave me to do. The master is returning. I want him to look at me and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come in here and enjoy this with me. Enjoy the increase with me. Colossians 3. I was actually listening to Josh Barnett. It's either last night or this morning, and he was teaching on Colossians 3. And I thought, oh man, I've got to remember that verse because that's going to go great Wednesday night. Colossians 3, verse 1. I'm reading out the NIV. He says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Set your attention, your hearts, your, your, your passion, what you emphasize in your life, what you prioritize in your life. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. The New Living Translation says, The realities of heaven. Set your heart on the realities of heaven. What matters? What matters to the master, the one that is seated at the right hand of God? Verse 2 says, Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. Being eternally conscious, being aware of eternity will prioritize my life. It will help me. If y'all are like me, it's very hard to say no. I was, on, I was on the phone today. I've got, you know, these fall into faith meetings. They're not just happening here. They're happening at Tim Brooks's church first, Ashley Ellison's church second, and here third, except theirs are going Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And at those, I will be teaching four hours not all at once, but four sessions at each of, each of those. And, and I, when Ashley asked me to do the fourth session, he called today and said, can you, because I was already doing three sessions, I was like, yeah, I have trouble saying no. Now, what he was asking me to do, okay, I can justify, but don't you find all kinds of little things that just keep you busy and you have trouble saying no? We've got to think eternally because there's sometimes we've got to say no in order to do the right, not just good things, but the best things. And I think sometimes we get that confused. He has promised rewards for those who think ahead with eternity in mind. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to be reading this to you out of the Amplified. I love in that other in the other scriptures where he talked about looking ahead. He, he wants us to find pleasure looking ahead. He actually has a reward for that. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to start reading in verse 10. According to the grace, the special endowment for my task of God bestowed on me, like a skillful architect and master builder, I laid the foundation. This is the apostle speaking. He says, and now another man is building upon it. But let each man be careful how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. But if anyone builds upon that foundation, if anybody builds upon Christ, whether it be with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, the work of each one will become plainly, openly known, shown for what it is, for the day of Christ will disclose and declare it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test and critically appraise the character and worth of the work each person has done. If the work which any person has built on this foundation, any product of his efforts, whatever, survives the test, he will get his reward. If we what we do on the foundation of Christ, if it is in sincerity and we're building upon that foundation for the kingdom of God, he says it will 
survive the test of fire and he will get his reward there is a reward but if any person's work is burned up under the test he will suffer the loss of it all losing his reward though he himself will be saved but only as one who has passed through fire so what he's saying here is is the person whose whose work is burned up by the test uh, it is not a good work built on the foundation of Christ. It doesn't mean he's going to hell. He's still saved, but he will lose his reward. But those who build upon the foundation correctly, there will be a reward. And the whole reason, I know we could get into a whole lot of theological thoughts there, but my point is reward, loss of reward. Reward, loss of reward. You know, salvation is not earned through works. And I want to make that real plain because we're talking a lot about what we do affecting our eternity. Salvation is not earned through works. It is the gift called grace. And Ephesians 2.8 makes that plain. I want to make sure that I made sure we're getting that. I put it in your notes in Ephesians 2.8. He says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We don't get saved by good works, but we're created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. There are things we should be doing in Christ Jesus. We don't do good works to get saved. We don't do good works to go to heaven, but we do good works because we're in Christ. That's who he is. If we're in Christ, we're going to be doing good works because that's who he is. We do good works because we love him. We do good works because we want to please the Father that we'll someday stand before, not out of fear. Look, the white throne judgment is not a place of fear for the Christian. We've been judged, and we've been found righteous. However, there will be a judgment of sorts where he rewards his people, and we'll read some of those scriptures here in a minute. But I want to make sure you understand, for you to stand before God's not a place of fear. It's a place of love. And it's going to be a powerful moment because it's in our heart to please him, and it's in his heart to reward you. That's a beautiful, that's going to be a beautiful moment. It's in your heart to please him. And it's in his heart to reward you. I, I read this somewhere, wrote it down. Didn't write down who said it. So I'll just give you this quote and say, anonymous. Rewards in heaven are the completion of our earthly story as we know it now. And those rewards will be eternally satisfying. So what you do here that you are rewarded there, they're not temporary like the work was here. The rewards are eternally satisfying. And I thought, what a thought. What a beautiful thought. The rewards that he gives us are eternally satisfying. Go with me to Mark 10. And we are actually not going to cover every scripture on your sheet, just in case it scared you when you looked at it. I will just mention some of them. Are your wheels turning? I hope it causes lots of questions. Please look for the answers before you call me. Don't be like the mate that goes and looks for the, says, do, you have, do we have any ketchup? <laughs> Did you look? <laughs> Did you look? Mom's laughing. <laughs> That's my husband. Yeah, she knows. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any butter? Did you look in the refrigerator? I, don't, I, I may not be able to answer all your questions, but I will certainly try to help you find an answer. But please, please look first. And uh, it's, it's just good when we dig for ourselves. Because you find all kinds of other good stuff while you're digging for that answer. And you really learn it much better 
as you know from school, if you, if you looked for the answer yourself instead of somebody just handing you the answer. Mark chapter 10, verse 29. I'm reading out of the Amplified. And Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has given up and left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospels who will not receive a hundred times as much now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are now first will be last then and many who are now last will be first then. Why did I bring you here? Now matters then. Now matters then. It matters. How we live matters. Our heart now matters. The scripture often speaks of different crowns in heaven that were gained on earth. He even told the disciples they would be on thrones. Why? Because of what they did here on earth. They would be honored. The apostles would be honored. I'm just going to run through a few of them. Those whose hearts look for Jesus are promised a crown. That's found in 2 Timothy 4.8. Those who look for Jesus. That's why that scripture just went off in me that we read a while ago, looking forward. We don't, we don't need to talk about the return of Christ like we don't want it to happen yet. I understand we need people to get saved in that aspect of it. But we need to be looking forward to the day that we get to see our Savior. Instead of looking at what we have here on earth and going, I don't want him to come yet because I haven't got to finish my house. We've got to judge our, our hearts. That just isn't love. So those whose hearts look for Jesus, 2 Timothy 4, 8, crown. Those who are triumphant over trials in James 1, 12, and in Re- Revelation 2, 10, crowns. Are they literal crowns? I don't have any idea. Except I do know when we, when we read the book of Revelation, it talks about crowns being cast before the throne. So there is some type of crown, apparently. And then my personal favorite is found in 1 Peter 5, 4, where the faithful shepherds get crowns. So, you know, if you're in leadership, if you're in church leadership, if you're leading people to Christ and you're a leader in the movement, then there's a crown. We want to do it well. There's a reward. He sees it as something special. There's, there's quite a few scriptures. If you want to just go on and, and look for the word reward, now a lot of it's going to be the reward of the wicked uh, for what they have done, and so you'll have to really read to see who he's talking to. But if you look up the word reward, you're going to find a lot of scripture content. Let's look at Revelation 22, verse 12. We're getting through this faster than I thought. We're doing good. How's the taco holding up out there? Y'all good? Need to do a few jumping jacks while we're turning scriptures? or They've got it good and cool in here, so y'all look good and awake. Revelation 22, verse 12, I'm reading out of the Amplified. Jesus is speaking. He said, Behold, I am coming soon, and I shall bring my wages and rewards with me to repay and render to each one just what his own actions and his own work merit. I love that. I'm coming, and I'm coming back soon, and I am bringing with me my wages and rewards. That ought to be exciting to us. If, (laughs) If we're on the right side of the coin, that ought to be exciting to us. Then again, Jesus is speaking in Matthew 5. Give you time to turn there. Matthew 5, verse 11. Did most of you know that there was reward in heaven? Nod your head. Okay. Matthew 5, 11. Blessed are you when people insult you, 
persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Now you can get on Facebook and gripe all day long about how people are persecuting the Christians over the casino or over abortion or whatever. Uh, Jesus just said, blessed. Blessed are you when people insult you, when they persecute you, when they falsely say all kinds of evil things against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. Well, that would be a turn of events if you all got on Facebook and said, Man, I am so excited. You would not believe what this person insulted me with. It would be a whole, ter- whole turn on Facebook if you did that. Rejoice and be glad because great is your re- reward in heaven. God takes note. He notices. And he said, Great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Is it anything new? Get through this. Be thankful that it's happening because of me and because of what I'm doing in the earth. And when you get here, I've got reward for you. In fact, I've got great reward for you. And if you look at how he treated the martyrs and the different ones who come uh, during the tribulation period, who suffered greatly, and he avenged their blood, and, and how he loved them, and he listened to their cry. Remember, they were crying out from under the altar. Uh, God takes note, and there is great reward. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Aren't y'all glad we've already been through the book of Revelation so we can connect all these dots back to it? I've referred to it many, many times because we went through it verse by verse. Reading out of the Amplified, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Oh, I like this one. Verse 9. Therefore, whether we are at home on earth away from him, or away from home and with him, we are constantly ambitious and strive earnestly to be pleasing to him. That made me think of those servants with the talents. When he comes, we just, we just want to be pleasing to him. We have, the church has got to get their heart back there. We've got to get our heart back there. We're, we're way too much living out there and then coming in here and living separate lives. We want to be pleasing to him constantly ambitious and strive earnestly to be pleasing to him. I'd make a great confession for in the morning, wouldn't it? For we must all appear and be revealed as we are before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive his pay according to what he has done in the body, whether good or evil, considering what his purpose and motive have been and what he has achieved been busy with and given himself and his attention to accomplishing. Do I need to read that again? Y'all are looking at me like, oh snap. <laughs> we must all appear and be revealed as we are before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive his pay according to what he has done in the body, whether good or evil, considering what his purpose and motive have been and what he has achieved, been busy with, and given himself and his attention to accomplishing. I want you to understand your judgment is good. He's looking to reward here. Your punishment was put on Christ. When you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your punishment was put on He's not talking about punishment here. He's talking about reward for you. Yes, there is punishment for those who have not been born again. But... but that's not levels of punishment. They've either accepted Jesus as Lord or they haven't. And that's the dividing line. You've accepted Jesus as Lord. That means your sin nature went on to him. You've accepted that. And so your judgment is good. It is good. And he will see the good, what you've been busy with, what you've been giving your attention to accomplish. Matthew 25. This kind of explains that a little bit. Matthew 25, verse 31. And I'm reading out of the King James Version on this one. Jesus is speaking. 
He said, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he set upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a sheep divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand. I just think that's interesting because who's at the right hand? Jesus. He shall set his sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand. Who's on the right hand? And me. <laughs> He's put his sheep on the right hand. And the king will say to them that are on his right hand. This is what he's going to say to you. He's going to look at you, and he's going to say this. Come, you blessed of my Father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Man, that is what it's all about. Come. You blessed of my Father and inherit the kingdom that's prepared for you. He has things prepared for us that are beyond words. John could not even express the things that he saw. Put them into words in the book of Revelation. And he said, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And every time I read that part of foundation, I think about the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. That's how he prepared it for you. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And we inherit the kingdom that he prepared for us. And, and how do we do that? How do we get our name in the Lamb's book of life? That's accepting Jesus as your substitute. Accepting him as your Lamb, as your substitute. That's how your name is written there accepting Jesus as your Lord and when we get there into the kingdom of heaven there's bonuses that's all I know to tell you like being with God and being in the atmosphere of heaven and the new heaven and the new earth as if that wasn't enough he is the father of all fathers and on top of all the goodness and beautifulness and awesomeness and amazingness bonus bonus I saw what you did. I saw when you fed them and nobody else saw you feed them. I saw when you got up in the night and prayed and nobody knew what you were doing. I saw when you studied. I saw when you, I saw when you. Isn't that what a good parent does? I remember a, a statement that, that went around for a little bit uh, to, to say to kids, and I caught you being good. I caught you being good. And I love that. Remember when we, bet, when we read the book of Revelation? Uh, Revelation 2 and 3 had the letters to the churches. Y'all remember those? Sardis and Ephesus and Laodicea. You remember how in almost every one, when every one he offered a reward, but some of them were for here on earth and some of them were for heaven. And so I just quickly went through them today. I may have missed one. I, I hope I didn't. But on the ones that had to do with the reward to those who overcome. Overcome here. This is what, what you're doing here affects something there. I, I want to get that through our heads. Now matters. Eternally. It matters eternally. He said... Uh, to those who overcame, he would give to eat of the tree of life. And remember, we just read that in the new heaven and the new earth. We read about the tree of life that would be there in the street and that uh, there would be fruit on it and then the nations would come in and eat of the leaves of it and it would be healing for the nations. But he said, you who overcome will get to eat of the tree of life. And one of them, y'all probably remember this one. He said, to you who overcome, I'll give you a white stone with a new name. We don't know what all that entails, but it's a bonus to those who overcome down here. And then in one of them, he talks about to the one who overcomes, they will be, there will be ruling positions over the nations. That means overcoming down here 
put you in a position to rule nations on the new earth. It matters. Earth, what's happening here, it matters. They're not separated. They're connected. And actually, your eternal life has already began. It doesn't begin when you die. You're eternally alive right now. And so we look at it as two separate things. It's really not. There are simply ages of your existence. The Bible uses the word ages, or we might say stages of your existence. Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And though I'm talking faster and seems like I'm winding up, I'm actually winding down. So, 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm going to start reading in verse 17 now, the NIV. Interesting stuff. The apostle said, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Isn't that great? That's here. Command them to do good. That's a pretty strong word. I'm just going to take the words from the apostle here, and I'm going to say, do good. He's commanding us to do good. No, your salvation is not dependent on you doing good. But now we're in Christ. That's who we are. We do good. Command them to do good. Command them to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. What? Doing good and being generous here lays up a treasure for me there as a firm foundation for the coming age? Yes, yes it does. And I don't know that that's necessarily treasure like we think of treasure. Because, you know, I go all pirate on you when you talk about treasure. It, 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 it may go back to what we've consistently seen the past three weeks in Scripture where if we're faithful here, we're, we're, we're tr entrusted with people there. True treasure. I don't know. doesn't say. just says they'll lay up treasure for themselves as a foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Truly life. Y'all can just meditate on that. That's so full of good stuff. Luke 18, verse 22. This is the story, if you'll remember, that what we call the rich young ruler has come to Jesus. And wants to know what he has to do. Luke 18, 22. And I'm just going straight to the the verse that, that covers what we want to cover here. He says, When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. What he did here mattered. And in this case, you know, Dad always said this, I can't read this to you, but it makes sense. Jesus was trying to free him from all of the things that... that he, his luggage. Because he said, then come follow me. He was giving him an opportunity for discipleship. But first he had to lose all the stuff that was key, he was keeping up with. He didn't tell him, give everything you've got away or give everything you've got to the poor. He said, free yourself up and come follow me. I think that could be the message of the night. Free yourself up and come follow me. You will have treasure in heaven. He 
His return is good. Oh, it's good. And it'll be an exciting time for the believer. Rewards are going to abound. I think we'll be really surprised at what's laid up for us in heaven. And if you go back and, and just study the reward scriptures, I think we're just going to be shocked at what he has laid up in store for us. And no one's going to be jealous and nobody's going to be envious because somebody got a reward and everybody on the team didn't get a ribbon or a trophy. That's just not how it's going to be there. In fact, you know, in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, when it talks about when, when something good happens in the body of Christ, the whole body should rejoice, that's going to be the ultimate there. And when somebody is honored, the whole body of Christ is going to rejoice because they've been honored because of what they did for the kingdom of God. I love that. Hebrews 6, I didn't put this in my notes, but I think it's a good one. Hebrews 6.10 6, 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love. He's just God. He's not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown towards his name and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. I don't care if it's cooking taco salad. You hear me? We look for these big glorious things but God sees the heart of things. And it's beautiful to him. I remember <laughs> dad used to have this saying. He'd say, they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. <laughs> oh, you remember saying that, Pop? <laughs> Some people are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. I thought about that saying when I was thinking about being eternally minded. And I thought, yeah, but do earthly good because you are heavenly minded. That's, that's what I hope. As much as I want to understand heaven, the new heaven, the new earth, and how glorious and how wonderful that is, I need it to change how I'm living right here. I need it to affect the heart of me. And, and it has. Um, there's been times today that I could have really been in the flesh. <laughs> and... Uh, I just thought, you know what? It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Because how I'm living here, I have a master who is coming back. And I don't want to say, oh, I was scared or I was offended, so I didn't do this. I was, no. I'm looking for that good and faithful servant. Well done. Come on in, aren't you? Y'all can stand. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. We pray that this message has uplifted, encouraged, and motivated you today. You can find us online at rccenter.org or visit us at 305 Lakefront Drive, Russellville, Arkansas.